Hi, and welcome to Off the Charts for Week 9 of the NFL season. I'm Mark Simon, along with SIS VP of Football, Matt Manicharian. What's up, Mark? And our fantasy gambling guru, Corey Marsh. Hey, Mark. It's good to be back. We welcome Corey back. A couple of topics before we dive into games for Week 9. Mike White won for the Jets. Trevor Simeon won for the Saints. Cooper Rush won for the Cowboys. And Geno Smith won for the Seahawks. So by the time most of you listen to this, Mike White will have played a second game. But let's ask what's next for the other guys and start with Simeon, who's now lodged in there until Taysom Hill comes back. Matt, what's next for Trevor Simeon? Mark, can you say Mike White won five times fast? Maybe you won't even need to say it again. Who knows? For Trevor Simeon, we talked last week about the Saints trying to find a way to manufacture offense, right? We knew going into the Bucs game, their run defense, they'd have to manufacture offense is what we talked about. They obviously did exactly that. I think whether it's Simeon going forward, whether it's Taysom Hill going forward, they're going to have to do more of that. Simeon got them through, but if you really look deeper dive into the advanced stats, he was only on target. That that means an accurate ball thrown, not just catchable, but on target on 54% of his passes. Not great. Average throw depth was just 7.3. That equals Winston's lowest of the season. Obviously, you'd want to have a higher on target percentage with throws that short. I think going forward, either of those guys, no Mike Thomas, it's going to require Sean Payton being more and more creative as they go along. You're going to see more of this screen game type stuff. You're going to see more cleverness in terms of the way that they run the football. And I think when Taysom Hill comes back there, you're going to see a little bit more trickeration. I remember Gina Smith being someone that I guess people dreaded seeing come into games. People dreaded seeing him start games. What's your take on Gino and uh, his performance uh, backing up and now starting for Russell Wilson? I think he did about as good as anyone could have hoped. Seahawks fans could have hoped. Despite a one and two record, both of the losses were close losses. Could have won either of those games, obviously didn't, but I think did enough to keep Seattle in the hunt. They're only three and five, but if you look at the NFC playoff picture, right now the Panthers are barely holding on to that last playoff spot at four and four. So the Seahawks are just a game out. They'll be going back to Russell Wilson after their bye week. He's been leading the league in IQR. So chances are they'll be in the thick of things for the rest of the season. As for Gino, since week five, when he started playing, he actually had more passing points earned than Patrick Mahomes. So interesting stat there. And when you talk about IQR, just making sure everybody knows that's independent quarterback rating. That's quarterback rating that adjusts for things like drop passes by both the offense and the defense in, in the case of interceptions, amongst other things. Interesting you say that there, that he's outperformed the Mahomes in terms of total points over the, over the last few weeks because he actually had two negative total points games in a row and then came through with 10 total points against the Jaguars. I think if Geno could play the Jaguars every week, that would be wonderful for him. Fortunately, that's not the case, but he did a good job as a backup quarterback. There's no doubt about it. So with the Cowboys stack, Prescott could start. But if they have to go to Cooper Rush again, Matt, what are they getting? They're getting a mediocre backup quarterback. He had negative two total points in a win. Like we talked about with Geno, did enough to get the win. Like Simeon did last week, enough to get the win. But there's no reason to believe, based on what he did last week, that this is a Wally Pip situation or as it might have been a a Dak Prescott situation to Tony Romo uh, in that case. Or a Tom Brady. At Tom Brady, another Wally Pip situation. Or Mike I, White. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I appreciate the honesty. It's funny how like you get the rose colored glasses of the wow, he, he won a game. It's like it becomes like a shock when a backup quarterback wins a game. Corey, how does the presence of these guys looking ahead to, to coming weeks impact the fantasy performance of others on their team? In the case of the the Saints, I actually think it'd be in their, their best interest fantasy wise to turn to Taysom Hill. Simeon did pretty well against the Bucks defense, which is obviously a great defense. They have the Falcons coming up, not such a good defense. Been pretty vulnerable to quarterbacks on the ground. Last week they gave up 66 rushing yards to Sam Darnold. I think the Saints could really take advantage of that matchup with Taysom Hill on the ground. And I think overall the dual threat ability that he brings to the table is better for their for their overall team interest and fantasy interest. You have a recent update from uh, from John Veros on on Taysom Hill's status in terms of injury. I don't have an update from John Veros, but I did see that he returned to practice to practice off of the concussion list. Okay, so there's potential that that he's going to be he's going to be right back in there this week. I hope so. I got him on literally all my fantasy teams. <laughs> we'll get to the other big backup this week as Jordan left for the Packers. When we get to previewing Packers Chiefs in a second, but I want to attack the NFL trade deadline first. Von Miller goes from the Broncos to the Rams. Matt, how do you view this trade from the Rams' perspective? 
I mean, it's really easy, like as the analytics, you know, perspective to come and say just bad idea, don't trade future assets, but they're trying to win the Super Bowl. The fact of the matter is with a trade like this, everybody's going to play the result. If they win the Super Bowl, it was a great move. If they don't, then, then it wasn't. That really how I look at it from their perspective is that, yeah, go ahead and win the Super Bowl now. Go go make this a good move by winning the Super Bowl because that's really, really all that that matters from here at this point. I don't mind it. I'm not going to be that analytics guy telling you that you can never do this. I think they're they're certainly all in on what their strategy is right now. They've got no assets going forward. I'd hate to be on their scouting staff. But what they're doing, they're trying to go win the Super Bowl, and I, I don't think you can get mad about that. It's a shoot your shot kind of mentality, basically. What about from the Broncos' perspective? From the Broncos' perspective, I love it. I think that they they assess where they're at this year. They assess their future, basically where they would have been tied, their their hands tied behind their back in free agency, hoping that Von Miller gets signed by a lot somewhere else. They can pick up the future third round compensatory pick. Here they've got a better third round pick than that coming at them, plus a second round pick, plus they don't have to wait for it, plus they can go spend in free agency. I think it's it's a it's a, a few wins strung together for them. The the one thing that stinks is they're going to lose a really good player for the rest of this year. I, I give them credit though for looking at their division and saying the Raiders, the Chargers, and the Chiefs and and where we look at things right now, they're they're on the outside looking in in the AFC playoff picture. I, I think that it was a reasonable move. And I think that once they get to the end of the season and, and the tears subside and all that kind of stuff, he was a great player for them. And he's going to continue to kind of paying them some dividends in the future in, in the form of those assets. It's basically an A plus for self-awareness on their part. Corey, how does this affect how you look at the Rams opponents from a fantasy perspective? The Rams defense already had the highest pressure rate in the league. So I don't think it moves the needle that significantly in terms of their opponents. There's still a, a decent matchup for quarterbacks that can handle pressure. Teams will need to be putting up points in order to stay competitive with the Rams. So don't think it's it's that significant. So continue to do what you would do otherwise. So I, I want to ask a question off that. This, this will take you inside the mind of someone that's playing fantasy. When you're setting up your lineup for a particular week, are you... Uh, how when you see someone's playing the Rams, uh, do you you know unless it's a, a top five player, top ten player at a position, are you wiping them out right there, or are you, are you rolling the dice? It's yeah, they're they're not the matchup that I would look at and look to avoid completely. It's not a plus matchup. It's not the sort of a matchup that you look at and say this player is automatically going on the bench. There are a few of those out there from a plus matchup and a, a really bad matchup perspective, but I wouldn't call the Rams either of those. I think you just kind of see them on the schedule and, and roll with it. So, Mark, there's a, there's a difference here in terms of like the way I would look at this in terms of if I, I don't want my quarterback having to deal with Von Miller and Aaron Donald and all this kind of stuff, I, I'm worried about how he's going to play. From a fantasy perspective, though, you're really thinking about opportunity, and these guys are going to have to throw the ball a lot to keep up with the Rams scoring on offense. So from a, from a fantasy perspective, I don't think you have that same sort of matchup fear. Corey, not to go too deep into this, but what's one example of a, of a matchup where you're saying, no, I don't, I'm not going to play my guys against these guys. I tend running to backs against the bucks, <laughs> running backs against the bucks. If you've read any of my content, if it's the SIS newsletter or some of our prop betting content, that's the one that I love to point out is just the teams aren't, running against the Bucks because they haven't had success. So they're taken to the air. Running backs aren't getting much of an opportunity on the ground. And because they have to always play catch up, basically. That too. You bet on, you bet on quarterbacks against the Bucks a few times this year. Is right. that still something that's, that's in the wheelhouse or you, you cooled off on that? People caught on to it. Cooled off on that a little bit because the Bucks' pass defense has, has been good. They've, you know, despite teams having to pass a lot against them, they've, they've upped the level and been able to, to stop opposing quarterbacks from putting up huge numbers. And Vegas has caught on to it too. The fact that teams are throwing so, so much so frequently against the bucks, they've raised the the bar on prop bets, more attempts, more completions, things like that. The other move of note, the Steelers trade three time pro bowl linebacker, Melvin Ingram to the chiefs chiefs desperately needed some help there. Their linebackers ranked at the very bottom in both run defense and pass defense points per play in our system and their bottom 10 in pass rush. Matt, can you grade the significance of this move? I feel like this is one of those spots where you should like play back the clip from last week where we were talking about teams that could make moves. This is exactly it. Chiefs get pass rush help on the edge to allow Chris Jones to move back inside full-time. Watching, watching what they're doing up front 
I was paying close attention last week. They've been doing some odd front stuff too. They're really moving him around to different positions. I think that'll be something that serves them well going forward, that he's been cross-trained a little bit and can move around. But I think what they want to do, especially if they're doing some more of this odd front stuff, get Ingram there, get him to be that guy on the edge, and then allow Chris Jones to be even that much more impactful. You know, teams are really double teaming him wherever he goes. If that's going to give us one-on-one with Melvin Ingram, you know, absolutely. So in terms of the player breaking down the stats, he's rushed on 127 of his 151 pass rush snaps so far this year, Ingram has. He's got just one sack, but he's got 20 total pressures and two holds drawn. So those are two positive indicators of his production going forward. For comparison, Von Miller has four and a half sacks, but he has just one more pressure than Ingram. He's got 21 with zero holds drawn, and two of his sacks were unblocked. So you really think about that, you know, like it's not such a far jump to say four and a half sacks. Take out the two one block ones, you're at two and a half, zero sacks, add in the two holds that you got, you're at two sacks. The production really hasn't been very far off between these players. So so I think this is a nice move kind of under the radar a little bit for the Chiefs. Corey, what would you say about the Chiefs defense as it pertains to fantasy players and gamblers? I was actually really interested to hear Matt's take on that. I think Matt's take helps influence my take. Um, on paper, it was I thought it was a good move too. But the, the the Chiefs defense was a major weakness. I think Matt's insight about how it's like a multifaceted improvement is really interesting. So I think it's still a matchup they continue to target. Like I said, the Chiefs defense has been a major weakness. According to total points, they've been especially bad against the run. Uh, looking at Melvin Ingram's numbers over the past few years seems to be solid against the run. So should be a bit of an improvement there, a bit of an improvement overall. But same sort of thing. The Chiefs offense is going to continue to put up points and teams are going to have to continue to put up points in order to hang with them. So a really good matchup from a fantasy perspective. I'm still with you there, Corey. It's not like I think that they just became a top defense in the league. I think it helps on a couple levels. Like I said last week, though, part of it was this is a very difficult defense to add back end help and have that person get involved in the scheme and be able to run all the complicated stuff that they want to do on the back end. Where on one call, depending on the backfield, they could have 20 different ways that that gets executed. In terms of getting somebody in there to say, you know, go get the quarterback, go block, go stop this gap in the run game. That's a little bit easier. You know, that that's a step to help make this like less of a, of a Swiss cheese defense. It's not, you know, it's not all of a sudden beefing it up like like potentially the Rams are. Before we go take a look at week nine's games with Corey here, I want to talk about SIS's football projections. These are pretty cool. They're very detailed. Corey, what's the best thing about them? On the NFL front. It's the fact that we're combining our really detailed data with a really elaborate algorithm produced by our R&D team and a manual component, too. We go through each week and check and see if there are any percentages, any numbers that stand out and fix them based on our own our own knowledge, our own insight. So really strong from several layers on the college side. It's just mainly the fact that they exist. It's, It's hard to go out there and find good college football projections especially ones that incorporate such a high level of quality data like we have here at SIS. So with with each of those, the NFL and the college projections, you can get category level projections. So for receivers, how many targets do we project for them? How many reception for running backs, quarterbacks, wide receivers, defenses, tight ends, what have you. So really good for fantasy and for betting purposes too, if you're looking to use that as a resource for prop betting. And where can people find them? People can find them on sportsinfosolutions.com. If you go to the product drop down on the top of the page, you can find the downloads page, and that'll take you to find both sets, college and pro. With that, let's start our week nine preview. Make some projections here with Chiefs Packers. Since we just talked about Kansas City, let's shift to the Packers. Aaron Rodgers is out. He wasn't vaccinated. He got COVID. His team pays the price now. With Jordan Love, I feel like what we're doing is going to be a lot of guesswork. Let's look at it from the perspective of a scouting and coaching checklist. And I'll start by quoting the 2020 football rookie handbook. Our scouting report on Love was an athletic quarterback with special arm talent, ability outside of the pocket, needs to improve accuracy, short to intermediate passing game, poise, and mental processing to take his game to the next level. He flashes win because of traits, is right now a sufficient win with quarterback coming out of college, fits best in a system where the read option is a presence and he can make quick reads to get the ball out of his hands. That from Ronan Potts and Alec Mallon. Lot to intake there. Matt, given Jordan Love's skills, is he well-equipped to run this Packers offense? Physically, yes. Mentally, to be determined. 
Jordan Love, you know, just like just like you read from the scouting report there by Ronan and Alec, two two excellent guys from our scouting staff. What you see with him from an arm talent perspective, from an ability to run with the football perspective, he's got every skill that you look for, not just from a, a standard drop back quarterback, but also from an athletic standpoint when we talk about the, the position. So in terms of being well equipped to run the Packers offense, absolutely. I think it's a very quarterback friendly offense. Maybe not as much read option in there. Maybe they will go in that direction with him to get him into the shotgun if he's more comfortable with that. But generally, it's more of an under center play action thing. We know that Aaron Rodgers has had his ups and downs in terms of his relationship with the, the play action game. Physically, there's there's nothing, there's there's no box left to be checked. Mentally, that's the big question. Because from what you get with Aaron Rodgers and the way he runs the Packers offense to what you're going to get with Jordan Love, it's going to be night and day. It's going to be really a, a work in progress that remains, remains to be seen in terms of what he can do from that perspective. Possibility, certainly, for panic in specific situations. What can Matt LaFleur do to put him in the best position to succeed? Well, he's really got to do all the things that got him hired, right? You think about Matt LaFleur and kind of coming from the, the systems that he's come from where, okay, we've got this great scheme and we can build this scheme around being able to kind of cover up for things that maybe are lacking in our quarterback game. We want to have this kind of Shanahan style outside zone run game, play action it up, get things going off of there. All the things that we love about Kyle Shanahan and that we love about Sean McVay and the way that they do their thing. Those are the things that got him hired. And theoretically, those are things that your running game can be your quarterback's best friend. And really, I think that the way what he can do kind of taking that a step further, besides like do all the things that that your offense is supposed to do, in being a quarterback friendly offense is actually to involve Jordan Love in the run game. So the more you can actually involve him in things and create kind of an extra gap that the defense has to account for by having him involved in the running game, I think that you can help create an advantage in the run game. And then through that advantage, you can then work the play action game off of it even more. So I think that it, it fits a lot based on, you know, the things that, that got LaFleur hired, the, the things that we love about this offense He's got to really go back and really embrace all of those things in order to put Jordan Love in the best position to succeed. And you said special arm talent is one of the things that's highlighted in that scouting report. How special is special? I mean, special is really special. This is one of these guys that we've seen out in the past, come out in the past few years, kind of in this post Rogers Mahomes world where you see Zach Wilson, for example, and these off platform throws and it's going 70 yards and zipping out of his hand. That's what you saw from Jordan Love at times especially when you saw him in 2018. That was his second to last year in college back at Utah State. That year, he was throwing the ball all over the place. He looked absolutely unbelievable. There were Mahomes comparisons all over the place going on with him. And and you could really see why when you turned on the film. But he went from having 0.22 expected points added per dropback that year. So 22 expected points added per 100 dropbacks that year. Being really good to, as a senior, being negative, right? Negative four expected points added per 100 dropbacks as a senior. It was about the pressure. It was about the way he performed under pressure. He went from being kind of a decent quarterback under pressure in 2018 at 78 was the IQR down to 44, right? Basically the equivalent of just throwing it into the ground every play in 2019. So really what it comes down to is he was in two different offenses there. He was very clean in 2018. And in 2019, things got a lot rougher, things got a lot dirtier. And when things got dirty and he was making some of these off-platform plays, all the things that the wow throws and stuff like that, it was a little bit like when we saw Mahomes struggle in the past couple of weeks. It was, oh, wow, he's still got that wow throw, but it doesn't look so wow when the other team catches it. So the arm talent's incredibly special. The, the question, like, I, like I've been getting back to with all of these, is sort of like the mental component and if he can tie that together. And, you know, like we said, that'll be on the floor. And one other scouting aspect question, is there anything differently that you would do from a Kansas City perspective specific to love that you would do rather for him rather than for Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, against Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers is our first, second and third responsibility when we're playing the Packers. Like everything is about Aaron Rodgers, figuring out a way to disrupt Aaron Rodgers and then hopefully, you know, cut off the head and the body will die. Something like that is really what you're trying to do when you when you go against them. This is completely the opposite situation. Now we think about which of the weapons we can take away, right? Like, how are we going to tr- control Devontae Adams? How are we going to control the running game? How are we going to control anybody else that scares you on this team? And I don't know who's even out with all the different COVID that's floating around their locker room at this point. 
So what you want to do in this case is completely differently. You want to attack. You want to make them one dimensional. You can't be scared of Jordan Love just coming out the locker room. You've got to try to bring it to this defense. You've got to attack their offensive line. You've got to attach their running game. You've got to make sure Aaron Jones can't get going at all so that so that that's stuck. And you've got to force Jordan Love to beat you. If Jordan Love beats you, you shake his hand at the end of the game and you say, damn, this is going to be a, a good career for you. But otherwise, you're attacking him all the way. Corey, would you be comfortable doing anything with this game from the Packers perspective as far as fantasy or betting goes because of all the unknowns? The only thing I'm comfortable with saying is that you can downgrade all of the Packers weapons across the board from a fantasy perspective. Most significantly, Devontae Adams. Him and Aaron Rodgers have fantasy chemistry like like no other. The two of them are completely coexistent without Rodgers in the fold. I'd say it takes Devontae Adams from being maybe the top receiver in fantasy to more of like a high-end wide receiver too. So that means like if you're in a 12-team league, there are probably 12 receivers better than him. It puts him in like the, the 13 to 20 tier. When you combine the words fantasy and chemistry, that could mean a whole lot of different things, right? Like <laughs> fantasy chemistry could mean something that you know should stay between you and your your laptop. Fantasy chemistry could be a fun game where we take like science teachers from different high schools and you got to pick them and figure <laughs> out like different things. Like a whole lot of different ways that could go. Let's make that thing. Let's make that second one happen. The most interesting thing for me is to continue to watch Patrick Mahomes. It's been a rough go for him, despite the the Chiefs putting up a lot of points. He's played 52 regular season games with 15 plus pass attempts in his career, and his last four games have all been in the bottom 10 in terms of passing points earned. I think he's trying to put a lot on his shoulders to keep this Chiefs team competitive, and it'll be interesting to see how he continues to respond if he starts to bounce back uh, personally. In terms of this game, the fact that Aaron Rodgers is going to miss the game takes this from being what would have potentially been a, a, a quality win for the Chiefs to now a game that if they lose a lot of a lot of red flags, it kind of takes them from being the this is fine dog from the meme, like surrounded by flames to being engulfed by the flames. So a lot of pressure on the Chiefs to go out and win this game now. Matt, what's the most watchable thing in this game for you? Oh, I think that we've covered most of this. I mean, like the the, the Jordan Love switch is very interesting to me. All of the drama around Aaron Rodgers right now is interesting to me. I don't. I know you're a big Jeopardy guy. Is he out of contention for you as a host now, thanks to these shenanigans? It, you know, I it, I don't. I don't even know where to start in terms of in terms of all of it. I will simply say disappointing. Let's slide over to the Titans and the Rams. It's the Sunday night game. The Titans lose Derrick Henry. The Rams add Von Miller. We talked about Miller's addition already, Matt. How does Derrick Henry's absence change things up for Tennessee? Well, it changes everything, Mark. He's their absolute engine. I'm not shocking you here unless you came on, you know, to listen to the analytics guy tell you that running backs don't matter. He's the engine. He's he's their their offense. Most offenses revolve around the quarterback in the NFL these days. He's these one of these guys that still has this offense that looks like when I was playing high school football back in the day. It, it revolves around the running back, like 90s football. So that changes everything about kind of the nature of, of, of who the Titans are. Now that said, their strategy probably doesn't change much. They like to run the ball. That's who they are. That's who Mike Brabel is. That's what they're trying to be. That's, that's their identity. They want to run the ball. They want to control the game. They want to establish their physicality. Yes, they've got the best running back to be the, the kind of bell cow for that that has been around in the league. They're going to try to bring uh, Adrian Peters in back into the fold, see what he can bring as far as that sort of stuff goes. But really, it's going to be much harder because without that sort of a dominant player, it, it changes who they are. But if they can be their best case scenario going forward, then it's not going to be next man up. It's going to be next men up. They're going to have to fill what Derrick Henry did by committee, but they're going to have to try to maintain that identity. I really don't think they can try to change who they are. And all of a sudden, this is going to be revolving around A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown's a great player, but he, but I think that it's part of complementary football that makes him great. So I think starting with this week, where they need to keep the Rams offense off the field against their defense. I know their defense has stepped up a little bit. Bayard's been playing unbelievable. But they want to keep the Rams offense off the field. They want to control this game, like I said before. So they need to maintain their identity. They're going to have to find a new way to do it, though, without their engine. Corey, what's the most watchable thing from this game? I think this is the scenario that will show us just how much running backs matter. Matt alluded to it a little bit and just the, the significance that Derrick Henry is, how much he means to this offense. I think we're going to learn just, just how much running backs do or don't matter 
through the absence of Derrick Henry. I'm interested to see how it plays out. I'm going to disagree with that hard. I'm going to say that it's going to be a reflection on their offensive line, their coaching staff, the running backs that they have in the building and how they respond to it. I know we all love to take anecdotes and say, see, running backs matter. See, running backs don't matter. Or here's the situation. I, if your premise is this is a situation where it's more likely for running backs to matter than others, I think I'm a thousand percent on board with that. In terms of like deciding this great debate that doesn't actually have goalposts that are stationary, I think is less something that I can do. I kind of think that Derrick Henry, fast forward 10 years into the future, is Adrian Peterson right now. So I think that's a that's a fun narrative. Right. Yeah, it is kind of like what's the movie where they where they switch bodies like you have the mother and the daughter. They switch bodies. Freaky Friday. Freaky Friday. Is that what's going on here? Didn't think we'd be talking about Freaky Friday, but yeah, that's what's going on. All right, Mark. I'm sure you want to hear what I think is watchable in this game. The most watchable thing for me in this game is Ryan Tannehill. I'll I'll buy Corey's premise that we're going to learn something here. And I think what we're going to learn about is Ryan Tannehill. Is this Miami Dolphins' Ryan Tannehill perpetually mediocre, win in spite of Ryan Tannehill? Or is Ryan Tannehill that we've seen with Derrick Henry, the one that's got them in the driver's seat in their division, the one that has been in the playoffs the last couple of years, is this Ryan Tannehill that is actually something more than what he was before he got with with Derrick Henry. Obviously, Derrick Henry plus Marcus Mariota didn't do it. Ryan Tannehill plus Derrick Henry did do it. It'll be interesting to see now Ryan Tannehill minus Derrick Henry if that can still maintain the level of performance. Moving on, I find the Vikings-Ravens matchup interesting, and we always like to talk about Lamar here. Remember last week we talked about the Vikings' killer schedule and losing to the Cowboys hurts. They're basically playing to be the last wild card right now. Matt, is there something you feel good about with the Vikings? Would you believe me if I said Kirk Cousins? Yes. Starts with him. I think you'd have to feel good about how he's been playing, really without good offensive line play, inconsistency in other areas. Stefan Diggs has, you know, since he's been gone, it's really hurt them. You know, since they lost, I think it really goes back to when they lost Anthony Harris, kind of, he really held things together on their defense a lot, I think, as well. They just haven't been the same. I think they still have good players on their roster. You can feel good about that. Besides Cousins being in the top five in total points, this is still a roster with Dalvin Cook, Justin Jefferson, Harrison Smith, Harrison Smith, pass rushers, some linebackers. They are not lost completely. So, yeah, there's still stuff to feel good about, even though right now it does feel like you're a little bit in purgatory. Meanwhile, the Ravens are somewhat perplexing. They're coming off the bye. They have this awful loss to the Bengals. Matt was like super gung-ho about Baltimore shutting down Justin Herbert a couple of weeks ago. Then Joe Burrow went and had a great day against them, and he followed that by losing to the Jets. Back to the Ravens. Uh, Matt, what should we make of them going into this game? The Ravens are really good. Winning in the AFC North is really hard. These teams all beat each other up. It's been a physical division going back several years now, and uh, I think it's, it's never been truer than it is now. Two of the most analytically advanced teams in the league, the Browns and the Ravens, are both two of the most physical teams in the league, and I, I don't think that's a coincidence, even though everybody would have you believe that, that analytics and toughness can't go hand in hand. The Browns, for example, have the best roster in this division, I think I'd argue, and they're in last place. They're at four and four. So this is just a tough division. What do we make of the Ravens going into this game? They're really good. I think they have a really good opportunity over the next three weeks, too, because they're going outside of that division. So coming up, they play the Vikings at home. They're coming off their their bye while the Vikings are coming off a Sunday night game. That's sort of a double advantage there, or maybe a triple advantage. Then they travel to Miami on the short week. They'll have Miami on Thursday night next week. And you have to like their chances there. And then they'll get another 10 days off before they come back to face the struggling Bears. So three games there, three really good opportunities to win at games outside of their division that don't promise to bring, you know, what they had last time they played against the Bengals in that tough one. Their schedule will heat up down the stretch after that. I think they have two of three games against the the Browns, like in a three-week stretch, two games against the Browns. So that'll be huge. But now would be a great time to reel off three straight wins as they face somewhat weaker opponents from outside their division to try to build a little bit of sort of momentum here, a little bit of a lead in the division, and then be able to withstand as they get back to that. Just It's just going to be a tough down the stretch. These teams are all going to beat each other up. Or given the complexity of, of trying to evaluate the Ravens and trying to figure out the mechanics of the AFC North and the fact that they have Lamar, who's always exciting and very interesting to watch, give us something about Baltimore from either a fantasy or a gambling perspective that intrigues you. I, th- I agree with Matt the sense that I think Baltimore's 
better than they've shown so far. So I would continue to, to back them maybe before they get hot, side with them, place a bet on them to win, cover the spread in the next couple of weeks uh, before the public, before Vegas catches on. But aside from that, I think Lamar Jackson is one of, if not the best and most exciting players from a fantasy perspective. He averages his average throw depth is a yard and a half more than anybody else in the league. He's forced nine more missed tackles than anybody else in the league. So as far as that, that's a recipe for excitement. That's a recipe for fantasy success. Again, formulating like your mindset for a given week. Do you start with uh, if you were playing DFS and just playing for that week? Are you starting with Lamar and then building around that? Not necessarily. Lamar is definitely at the top of the list that if there's a plus matchup, you're trying to fit him into your lineup. But there there are a lot of quarterbacks that week to week can excel and exceed expectations that you're trying to find more of those low, low price guys. Lamar tends to have a high price tag if you're playing DFS. So if there's a if there's a great matchup for Lamar, you try and fit him in. But if not, you probably try and find that under the radar, cheaper quarterback to plug in. Are the Vikings one? No, I don't think so. I think the Vikings are a middle of the road defense, not one that you are targeting or avoiding. So I wouldn't be plugging him in based on that matchup. But if it makes sense for you and you have enough money to spend at the quarterback position, yeah, Lamar's a good option every week. With that in mind, then, who is your quarterback to, to take this week if you're, if you're looking for one quarterback specific to having a really good matchup advantage? So I mentioned Lamar's Lamar's price tag being something of something to deter you from plugging him in. He's seventy three hundred dollars on DraftKings, which is the fifth highest. Somebody who I would target much lower on the board, who I actually brought up earlier, is Taysom Hill. If he were to play, I like this matchup. Atlanta is pretty pretty susceptible to running quarterbacks, so I think that that's a good matchup for him. I think they're just a pretty poor defense in general, and he's only fifty five hundred dollars, which is close to the lowest among all quarterbacks. Hey, Corey, in a, in a similar direction to that one, what's the price for a Jordan Love this week? So he's actually close to the minimum. or So he's 4400 4, Oh, yeah, that's actually a good call. I usually don't even scroll down that far. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think maybe DraftKings put that price out there before there was any sense that he would be playing. So that's also a really good bargain. It's possible. Right. I mean, he, could, he to- could totally flame out. But, I mean, if you're trying to win contests, could be an interesting, interesting bet to make against the historically porous defense of the Chiefs. <laughs> exactly. We talked about the Chiefs defense being one that's worth targeting in fantasy. Pretty weak defense overall and should be another game where Packers are going to have to put up points and that's going to be a, a lot on Jordan Love to go out and make that happen. My Twitter feed next week, you told me to play Jordan Love. He had zero touchdowns and four interceptions. <laughs> What I think is is kind of funny is you're not going to find many quarterbacks at that price uh, against the Chiefs, I would imagine, the rest of the season. Anyway, let's close with scouts versus stats, and we'll make it on Aaron Rodgers. We'll start with stats and Corey's take. What are the numbers indicate that the fantasy impact for the Packers players will be this week, and maybe even beyond? So from a, a betting perspective for Sapphire, that since uh, Aaron Rodgers got ruled out, the spread has moved six and a half points. So that's Ooh. always something interesting to to look at when a backup quarterback is filling in for a starter, especially one as good as Aaron Rodgers. And I think that's pretty indicative of the impact that it has on players from a fantasy perspective. Like I said, I think you downgrade everybody across the board, especially Devontae Adams. I think you still play him in your lineup, but not with as much confidence. You're not expecting as much out of him. Aaron Jones, another guy you'll still play, but downgrade slightly. Aaron Rodgers loves to throw him the ball. Jordan Love, we'll see what his tendencies are. Does he love to throw the running backs as much as Aaron Rodgers? And I think the Chiefs will probably bring more defensive players forward to try and stop the run, stop underneath passes against Jordan Love. So that might play against Aaron Jones as well. I think those are the only two guys you consider playing. I like Matt's call about Jordan Love in daily fantasy. So fire away there. It's a high risk, high reward type of a play. And Matt, the scouting take? Yeah, my scouting take on Aaron Rodgers is, I guess I'll give the background. One of my best friends, Brett Oresco, uh, when this news was coming out, he's a big Packers fan. He reached out to me and he said, would you trade for Aaron Rodgers? Like if you were a team right now, say the trade deadline hadn't passed because he was about ready to just be done with Aaron Rodgers at that point, right? Lifelong Packers fan, absolute diehard, crazy person when it comes to this team. And that was the last straw for him. And what I wanted to talk about from a a scouting perspective here, 
relates back to a lot of the jobs of scouts that people don't think about, which is evaluating both personal character and football character. And when we talk about Aaron Rodgers from a personal character and football character standpoint, you know, for years and years and years, this has been somebody who's been an example of how to lead, of the type of work ethic that goes into being a franchise NFL quarterback. And then, you know, as as recent years have gone on, there's been different stuff, you know, disagreements with management, this and that. The thing from a football character, personal character standpoint that I think it's really important to note as a scout right now is that Aaron Rodgers lied. Forget about the vaccine, no vaccine, whatever soothsayer he's seeing that he thinks inoculated him. At the end of the day, this guy lied. And it's really hard to win football games when you can't trust somebody. This is a sport where you trust the 10 other guys on the field with you to look out for your head, right? To keep you physically healthy. It's an incredibly violent sport. People that have played it know it, but I don't think you have to have played it to understand the level of trust that this sport requires. That's the whole reason why he wanted Randall Cobb and all that stuff. So from a scouting perspective, I had to say to my friend Brett, no, I wouldn't trade for Aaron Rodgers. I, I'm, I'm the biggest Aaron Rodgers fan in the world for as long as I can remember. I think he's one of the best players in NFL history. And when you have somebody that outright lied in the way that he did, I have a big problem with how you can incorporate that with both from a personal character and from a football character standpoint, from being able to trust the way that you're going to need to work with somebody. I have a big problem with both of those things. And I would really be hesitant to trade for Aaron Rodgers for that reason. So from a scouting perspective, I do think there's a take to be had here, and it's about honesty. Glad you said that. This wraps up the Off the Charts Football Podcast for Week 9. You can find our content online at the Sports Info Solutions blog, Sharp Football, where Corey regularly writes on prop bets, and on our Twitter, football underscore SIS. For Matt Manicharian, Corey March, and our producer Justin Stein, I'm Mark Simon. Thank you for listening to Off the Charts. Off the Charts.